You are listening to the Heartland Author Podcast. I am Aaron Apollo Camp. For the first time in the history of the Heartland Author Podcast, I had the opportunity to interview three guests at once. I had the honor of interviewing Jack Bowman, Kitten Hall, and Lance Roger Atst, who are the authors of the companion book to the London After Midnight audio drama, which is based on the 1927 lost film of the same name. I'm here with Jack London, Kitten Hall, and Lance Roger Axe, A-X-T, who are the authors of the London After Midnight companion book. That's a companion book to the uh, audio movie London After Midnight. Jack Lance Jack, Lance, and Kitten, welcome to the Heartland Author Podcast. Thank you. I will point out that he's not Jack London because that's the author of White Fang. He is Jack Bowman. Jack Bowman, <laughs> excuse me. <laughs> that's all right. I just would have been polite and British and let you carry on. But uh... whereas, whereas I, I, I'm polite and Canadian, but it doesn't. Yeah, it means I'll, I, just, I'll just apologize uh, profusely after the fact. I'm sorry. Right. Sorry. So, I had it re- written down incorrectly in my notes. That happens sometimes. <laughs> but, that's, but that's all right. I mean, it, imagine the coup you would have pulled off if you'd resurrected a dead author to come back. Imagine the coup we would have pulled off if we'd resurrected the author of White Fang and brought and then him on board him, London After Midnight. And then ask him, okay, so, Mr. London, you, that la- unfinished uh, book you had, The Assassination Bureau, how was that going to end? There we go. Look at See? that. We're on top of it. That was got- thr- thrillingly, thrillingly. It was going to be so thrilling, but I'll take more questions on the subject. Yeah. Let's, let's, right. go, let's get back to London After Midnight, because that's, yeah. that's what we're here. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I'll start with Jack Bowman. Correction there. <laughs> Feel free to introduce yourself to our listeners. Uh, hi, I'm Jack Bowman. I am a audio drama, audio fiction producer. I've been doing this now about 17 years. And we recently, between the three of us, produced a audio movie remake of London After Midnight, starring Art Malik, based on the classic Lost Hollywood silent movie, London After Midnight. And uh, we have now just completed, certainly on my, my side yesterday, we have just completed our companion book, which we're here to talk about. Yeah, he's not editing it. He's completed. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm still working on Mastercraft. <laughs> All righty. Kitten, feel free to introduce yourself to our listeners. My name is, in fact, Kenton Hall. I know it does sound like the one that should be made up or possibly some kind of historic building that you visit on a wet bank holiday weekend. But um, I am Kenton Hall. I am a writer, actor, and musician because I decided I would like to be poor in three different fields instead of just the one. Uh, I co-wrote the script with Lance for Rod for London After Midnight for Roger After Midnight. Uh, <laughs> just keep it confused. Um, and co-directed it with Jack. And I also appeared in it as an actor. Um, I write stuff for money. That's what I do. Lance, feel free to introduce yourself to our listeners. For some inexplicable reason, my name is Lance Roger Axt. I have no idea why. And I am the co-writer and co-producer of London After Midnight, co-writer with Kenton, co-producer with Kenton and Jack. And uh, I do not act in the piece, though I do act regularly for audio. I've been doing this audio thing since 2003, roughly. And I have a company called Pocket Universe Productions, through which I have a podcast called Midnight Matinees, which is a horror anthology. And that's one of the places that you can hear London After Midnight. And you're going to hear a few other places where you can hear it as well. Um, And I contributed very, very minimally to the book that we're here to talk about today. But I did contribute something. So that's... You did write... Like, the script takes up a lot of pages, and you did go write... So you are are an author of the words that are in the book. Yeah, but I'm talking about stuff outside of the script. Oh, right. Yeah. Yeah. That's fine. A little stuff outside of the script. That's all right. I'm I'm editing Jack's production diaries at the moment, so I'm grateful to you for the small amount you wrote right now. Uh, (laughs) (laughs) All right. Uh, I'm going to go back to Jack for this question. What is the London After Midnight Dolby Atmos audio movie? Okay, so this is a crazy idea we had at the start of the year. I'm I'm a massive fan of missing media, massive fan of horror movies, and 
earlier this year, London After Midnight entered into the public domain. So I spoke to the two gentlemen here about proposing the idea that we would remake <coughs> London After Midnight, silent horror movie, as a full cast audio production piece, which we did. And it is a audio reimagining of London After Midnight based on the original screenplay written gallantly by uh, Lance and Kenton here, which is then in post-production being made into a Dolby Atmos mix. So this is like absolute gold standard in terms of a listening experience. So you could plug this audio into a movie theater and it will sound as good as a... Oh, are you foreshadowing? Are you foreshadowing? Are you foreshadowing the announcement? Uh, so um yes yeah, so basically we 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 have you know uh, we, through using dolby atmos we have recreated a lost horror classic movie just in audio form and the only thing missing are the cameras and that's it it, yeah. it is a beautiful thing to listen to a beautiful thing to immerse yourself into and for the first time in seven decades it's the mgm vault fire of you know 1965 where the last known print was destroyed it's the first opportunity for horror fans to actually enjoy London After Midnight as as anything. I'm going to go to Kenton for the next question. Okay. Without spoiling too much of the companion book to London After Midnight, what is that book about and how is the content within it structured? Right. So we, we've tried to make it as... It's 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 trifold. Let me let me say it works on three levels. Um, we so we have the original script uh, that Lance and I wrote uh, for the piece. We have uh, production diaries about the making of the the audio movie from Jack with interruptions from me, um, and then we have brand new uh, novelization of of the script which enabled that i wrote which enables us to go a little bit deeper into the story and and develop some of the backstory that the various versions of london after midnight had in the past and just retell the story in a different way so you you have the some insights into how to make an audio production on this level some <clears> of the the this, the the stumbles and the hurdles that we faced in doing it. You have um, a brand new novel and you have the uh, sort of the chance to compare that with the script and compare the audio movie with the script. In fact, the the, the hardcover version is currently on sale for pre-order. We'll get you a, a copy of the um, the audio movie as well. So yeah, it's, it's to give people a, a really encapsulated view of what it takes to make something like this, but then also some different ways to experience it as well. We're covering, we're covering London After Midnight from all potential uh, angles. Okay, uh, Lance, this next question's for you. What is the biggest difference in how, would, how one would approach creating an audio fiction production compared to writing a written word book novel? Well, <clears throat> writing writing the former means that you're ultimately writing the script. Um, you are the same form of script that you would see or that you would read from any film. If you were reading the script to uh, say L.A. Confidential, the the film version, not the not the original novel, you would be reading you'd be reading that version. Uh, that's what you're going to be getting here. Uh, if you're getting a a, tradi a traditional novel, you're reading prose. You know, this is not prose. This is a film script minus the film aspect of it, uh, because the film is up here in your head. And uh, I think that's what's going to. But what's interesting about this is you're getting the film script and you're getting the prose element as well. So you're getting two two separate but very in, interplayed, interconnected uh interconnected productions obviously you can tell it's 6 a.m here and my mind is still bleh. but uh, <laughs> uh but uh, you're getting two interconnected productions in two two completely different ways but you're going to find uh, hopefully enjoyment in both there you go i think having adapted the script into novel one of the one of the big differences between prose and and script is the ability to actually go into the the minds of the characters and explore the emotional aspect in prose which is something that the actors provide in the audio production they, you you 
you are left to extrapolate from the performance that they give what's going on in their minds. Whereas in writing the prose version, you're enabled to you're able to actually go inside their minds and actually explore what they're feeling in circumstances. And also it allows you to um dive backwards and forwards in time and, and and change the way in which you're telling the story but they're very completely different animals like despite having co-written the script with lance it was a very different challenge to write the novel because there are elements of the story that in the original silent film would have used certain techniques to get across in our audio version we use audio techniques to get across and now again i'm retranslating that and how do we use prose to create that atmosphere of gothic <clears throat> horror how do we use language to do the same thing that we did in the audio so it's it's been a very it's been a huge challenge to, to work in it in different mediums but i think it enriches the story by approaching it from all those directions and, I and it's going to be a, a, it's going to be another challenge as well for kenton and i hopefully next year if not next year the year after because we're looking to turn uh, london after midnight into a graphic novel as well Precisely, so there's yeah. a different another form of storytelling jack go ahead i'm sorry I was just going to say, so if you look at the journey of where it's come from, when we started the audio version, we went back to the original screenplay, which was a silent movie. So there was a silent screenplay, which then had to be fleshed out to be a piece of audio fiction. And from the audio fiction, you know, we got a lot of questions about how Kenton and Lance did that. So, and then they've now, you know, Kenton's now moved it onto a novella. They're talking about the graphic novel version and moving it through all these different forms of writing and, and media. And that's another reason for actually wanting to put the, the production diaries aspect into the book, because a lot of the questions we keep getting asked is, how do you turn a silent movie into an audio drama? How do you turn an audio drama into a novella, et cetera? So we're hoping that the book will be, a lovely sort of one-stop shop for everyone who is curious about, you know, even if it's just the, the language and the mechanics of the, you know, what Lance and Kenton have done in writing all these different versions and taking it from a single nearly 100 year old screenplay, which was for a silent movie with no dialogue. Jack, uh, how long did it take for the three of you to write the companion book to London after midnight? <laughs> I finished my, section yesterday that's the 26th of november um so i think it's i think the production diary we mooted the idea when we were first <clears> talking <throat> about the book about there being production diaries but i think i've been in the slog of that since or I must have started after we finished actually doing london after midnight because that was a priority we had to get that finished and ready for halloween so that finished 30th of september so it's taken me two months on and off to get the, the production diaries uh, together on my side and going back. And that's a research job because, you know, we want them to be accurate and make sure the dating aligns with, you know, the records and, and stuff like that. And also, you know, just trying to make sure as best we can, as there's a phrase I always remember, which is the memory cheats. So, you know, I actually thought we recorded London after midnight, early July, for example, and that's how the production diaries were being written. And so I went back and found out actually, no, it was the 25th and 26th of July. So already my brain was starting to either embellish or lose, you know, bits of critical data. So it was about I, thought we did, I thought we did it in 1927. <laughs> that's how long it <laughs> felt. felt like it. <laughs> um, so yeah, it's, it's, it's been about two months, you know, working out the journey and going back over the records to make sure that that production journal is as accurate as it can be but the memory does cheat yeah it's pretty similar for me with the novella i started work on it shortly after we finished recording and i've been obviously there's quite a lot of post-production which i was involved in as the co-director so i've been writing it slowly alongside all of that but now the last sort of three or four weeks have been really dedicated to that for getting it ready for publication um and prepping the script for publication because it's very different to presenting a published script to a script that you're working on in studio. So there's a few nips and tucks that need to be done there. Um, yeah, but between us, yeah, two or, two or three months to put the, pull the book together. I mean, obviously, some of that work is just inherent in the process of making the thing in the first place. We've kind of had this in the back of our mind since the beginning. So some of the prep work has been done for longer. I'm going to go to Lance for this next question. What oh. was the publisher of the companion book to London After Midnight? And was that a self-publishing uh, platform, a traditional publisher, or a hybrid press? Oh, that's definitely self-publishing. 
that's definitely self-publishing. I think self-publishing is going to be the way to go for just about everybody in the future. And if you look at self-publishing as an entity, it's truly one of the, the oldest and one of the best ways, I think, to get your work out there. I mean, let's be perfectly honest. Stephen King did not start with a major publisher. He was a self-publisher back in the 1970s. Um, but now going forward, I find that a lot of people that I know who are respected authors are going in that self-publishing route. And the one that I can think of immediately is Mark Ellis, who wrote the Outlander series. And now he is just a shoe traditional publishing altogether. And everything he does now is self-publishing. And he's a lot happier for it. I think there's going to be a lot more off authors. And I'm done talking about, you know, do-it-yourself authors, writers who can't get, you know, John Grisham type of deals who are going to be going self-publishing in the future. I'm talking about major writers like, say, John Grisham uh, or of the caliber of John Grisham going in a self-publishing route. Um, it's just going to be the new normal as uh, as we as we progress forward in this in this strange millennium we're in. Um, but that's that's where we that's where we took it. And we're a lot happier for it. And that just means ultimately, in the end, more money for us. <laughs> and that's uh, and that's uh, that's a, that's a plus in itself. I think the bit I think the where where sort of self publishing gets gets knocks is because a lot of authors they simply don't have the skill set to typeset correctly or to um, yeah. get, get covers done. And people I think people misunderstand what self publishing is because in essence we're just we're we're just acting as a small press for this particular book. I I genuinely I generally write for another small press for most of my prose work at Chimber Books. And I've learned an awful lot from being a sort of an author on 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 another press and enabled us to pull together a book that's going to be of professional quality, but I'll, but have control over it. Where any independent publisher or uh, all of our companies, where we're where you're always struggling is the fact that by comparison to big publishers and big production houses is advertising budget, which is why we why it's it's such a boon to have podcasts like this to come on and talk <laughs> about work because we can do the work to the same standard as as anyone else. It's about getting the word out about it. And that's why it's so great that there's now this network of people talking about books and talking about audio. But it's hard graft, you know. It takes a lot of elbow grease, a lot of time, and it takes the goodwill of the public to go out and seek things out rather than settle for the things that are being fired at them by companies with millions of dollars slash pounds to spend on putting in their eyes and ears. So boutique houses like us... Um, who who are putting out independent product? We're 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 reliant on people actually taking the step of going in and buying it, you know, and and making because it's what it makes it makes it possible for us to make more things, and to make more things out of professional quality. What it is beholden on us is to make sure our books look professional and our audio sound professional, and we're doing that bit. So we're we're fulfilling the remit of delivering something that's at the same quality as the as the bigger companies. Now we just need people to uh, buy it in the same quantities <laughs> as the bigger companies. So that's on you, people. <laughs> Come on, meet us halfway. <laughs> okay, uh, Kenton, I'm going to go to you for the next question. What was the hardest part of writing the comp companion book to the one and after midnight movie and i think for the from the novella perspective the the difficult part is really actually forgetting about the script but while i'm working from the script for the novella but i think with any adaptation you always get people who they're saying like oh the book the book and the film are so different from one another you see yeah because an antelope and a stepladder are different from one another they're completely different animals you can't think about one medium when you're writing in another so just as we did with the script where we thought okay how do we take this thing that the reason why it survived its loss is because the visuals were so iconic the atmosphere of the surviving photographs are so uh, gothic and and they evoke what the film must have been like so we used every audio technique we had between the three of us to evoke those things, to evoke the spookiness and the atmosphere and the horror, to cast an actor who could inhabit Lon Chaney's character in a way that replicated the look in a sound. 
So then going to the book, it's about, okay, well, how do I accomplish all of those things in prose now? How do I evoke that atmosphere? Um, yeah, I mean, I'm I'm drawing heavily on the dialogue that Lance and I wrote for the script version and, and using most of it. But in between that, I've got to now create in words what the soundscape created for the audio, audio movie and what the filmmakers, Todd Browning, would initially have created for the film. So that just takes sort of almost giving your head an etch-a-sketch shake and forgetting about the previous version and making sure you don't assume that just because the previous version works that you've captured everything that you need to in the in the novella. But uh, that's what I've always liked about, because in my work, I, I move back and forth between scripts and novels and, and prose and script all the time. So I always love making that shift because it forces you to think about the story again. And also there there's elements in a script because you're having to be pacey and keep things going that in a novel you can slow down and take a little bit more time over character interactions and characters histories and throw some more backstory in there that um just doesn't fit in the script format so yeah it's been able been able to expand the world a little bit in the novel as well okay i'm gonna go to jack for the next question during the covid lockdowns back in 2020 you were involved in an international horror horror audio series called Circles. What mm. was Circles about, and how did the logistics of that production work? Uh, Circles was pitched to me about three weeks into the first lockdown, so we're talking April 2020 here. A brilliant writer called Brendan Connolly um, just threw this idea at me about the idea of four teens trapped at home trapped in chalk circles being hunted by a demon that they had vanquished many years before, which was now on the loose and out to get its revenge on them. And as he was pitching it to me, he said, oh, it's all going to work through the idea that we're eavesdropping on telephone calls between these characters. And that's where this like little light bulb goes off in my head. It's the same thing with London After Midnight. As soon as I get the idea, it's like, could that be an audio thing? And if my brain doesn't let it go, it starts imagining me listening to the finished piece that's it. That's the kind of stuff we want to make. So with Circles, it was like, brilliant. I get it. I understand how this can work logistically um, in terms of telling the story. Then what we had to do, because obviously no one could get together, was I looked at it as an opportunity to just try and improve my production skills a little bit. So the first thing I started doing was actually talking to, to get the, uh, you know, the actual production approaches right, was actually talking to the people who run uh, ran remote D&D games for podcasts, because they had people playing D&D in various locations all over the world. How did you approach that? How do you recall people? How do you make the quality reasonably the same? And between that and learning very early on with the functionality of Zoom, I was able to build a virtual studio. And from there, we had uh, Tao, uh, Tao Minar, and they're in, uh, they are in the West Coast. We had Bryce, who is uh, East Coast US. We had the rest of the car spread across London, Oxford, and various parts of, of the UK. And, you know, we didn't have much else to do. So we just like spent three hours a night recording an episode, locking it down. Uh, and then post-production, you know, by that point, we're telling you looking at like May, June time. Um, most people had worked out how to switch processes to virtual anyway. So it was just a case then of running post-production in a, in a virtual way. And I think the results show it comes off beautifully. It's a beautiful piece. I'm so, so proud of it. And if anything, I think one of the... One of the things that always gets me about the beauty of the way Brendan ran a, a, a writer's room format with two other writers, James and Jim, on it. And I think one of the things that gets me is that script is so economical. It is so light with this depth of touch. You know, we have a Easter eggs guide, which has got 50, 50 Easter eggs hidden in it. And I think for a lot of people by that point, they just went, oh, it's just it's just people talking on the phone. And they just put it down to that. But it calls that it calls that a really lovely splash at the time. But I think a lot of people miss a lot of the nuances in the script, which is which is a shame because it's a it's a wonderful piece and uh, it connected with its audience and you know it ended up being an evergreen original by Halloween 2020. So hurrah! Um, but I mean, a good you know, all good learning curves. But I think the one thing that went on throughout lockdown, which I'm glad we've been able to fix, was London after midnight. Was after two years of the pandemic. 
I was ready to get back in a studio and do this on it, you know, do something like this on its feet. And that's what that's what London After Midnight was. It was like the antidote to learning how to remote record with all the pressures during the pandemic on things like circles. So wonderful breath of fresh air to actually after three, four years, actually get back into a proper sound studio, with the actors. Oh yeah. I mean, I, I like, I, I'm a writer 90% of the time. Uh, so I always have gone a bit peculiar by the end of a project. So by the end of the pandemic, I was downright weird. Uh, and, and the acting, I, voice acting that I do, obviously that was another thing that I built up over the pandemic because you were able to remote record, but actually being in a studio and acting across from these sort of like amazing actors, it was just, it was such a, it was good for my mental health, just being in the room with people and actually getting to play with other actors uh, was something I, I hadn't even realized how much I'd needed it until, until we got in there. It really, it really, it made it improved my life <laughs> doing it. So <clears throat> the rest of it has just about killed me. But that bit was <laughs> <laughs> swings and roundabouts, you know. <laughs> okay, a uh, Kevin or Lance, whichever one of you two would have an easier time answering this question. Uh, right. What are some popular platforms for audio fiction or scripted podcasts? Oh, Lance, you wanna you wanna you wanna jump that first? Yeah, I'll, I'll I'll start. Uh, I'll obviously Audible um, has been producing a lot of material over the course of the last couple of years, and I should know because I was part of some of it. Uh, going back to first the Starling Project with Alfred Molina, and then Lock and Key with Tatiana Maslany and. Haley Joel Osmond and Stephen King. Yes, that's right. We did Lock and Key first before Netflix got it. And then hey. the two-parter of The X-Files. And they've kept it going over the past couple of years, obviously with The Sandman by Neil Gaiman. Um, for those of you wondering, there is going to be a fourth and a fifth one. Uh, with uh, their acquisition of, this is a very big one for them, and I know for a fact that they've been after this for years, maybe even a decade, uh, that game, that uh, being the Buffy the Vampire Slayer franchise, and now they're creating an entire Buffy world around it. But also a lot of original work. That's the uh, direction that they've been moving in for a long time. Is why should we have to pay this amount of money for a licensed property when we can create our own and then sell it to our parent company of Amazon Prime, which is exactly what happened with Impact Winter. So. Audible's a place to go. Uh, obviously, the pl the best places to find fiction podcasting, I'm spe speaking specifically about fiction podcasting, are those networks that deal specifically in fiction podcasting. There aren't that many of them. There are not met that many of them. The one that I like that Midnight Matinees is on right now is a company called Fable and Folly. Fable and Folly has a lot of good material out there. And they have been working out a deal for their podcasters regarding advertising that most big companies do not have. Uh, unless you're a nonfiction podcaster, unless you're true crime, unless you're, you know, Malcolm Gladwell. Uh, but these guys have been revolutionizing uh, the art, if you will, of advertising for fiction podcasting. So much so that a bunch of major players are now going to them and asking them, how do you do it? Can you help us with ours? Uh, the other one that I can think of is Realm. And I'm thinking of Realm right now simply because they have quite a bit of material up that is Marvel and DC based. But what's interesting about them is a lot of that material is audiobook based. So it's one, two or three readers rather than what we're doing, which is not reading so much as the act of performing. So those are the three that I can think of off the top of my head. Uh, Kenton, if you want to jump in, or Jack, if you want to jump in, please go ahead. I think one of the I think one of the ma main things because during the pandemic there was a big boost in people listening to a lot of um, well we say fiction podcasts is such a hideous term. It's audio drama. It's audio drama. God damn it. Um, but people were listening to a lot more, which meant that there was a sudden influx of people making content. Now, the difficulty with any 
with any burst is people are always trying to work out how to monetize that and not yeah. not from purely a sort of a profit making thing but how do you fund it how do you pay actors and writers and directors to make a quality product and you're seeing a lot of really talented sort of um, audio drama makers who are be, are kind of feeling themselves forced into making things and putting them out for free um on to on places like spotify and apple podcasts and yeah those are great platforms for getting stuff out there but what we're still missing and other people like fable and folly are working really hard on that people like audioteria um people like paula plus that are creating sort of netflix style um offerings where people can a subscription service and people can listen to a lot of material but it's not i think when people hear monetization they think oh how do you make money off it it's not just that it's how do you make it profitable so that you can continue to make other things so that you can pay writers directors you can pay the talent that you need to come and make something that's extraordinary i think i think also there's been a, a long standing feeling that somehow and this goes back to the early days of like in us radio and bbc radio in, in the uk of that somehow radio is just like a testing ground for film rather than a medium in its own right i think we've seen part some podcasts cross over and to be made into television series um but that shouldn't be the first thought the first thought is to actually use this extraordinary medium which still contains elements that that no other medium can do that that the cinema of the human imagination and how do you make something that that can be a going concern so that it attracts high quality talent to do it that the writing has to be to a certain quality because that's what the audience is going to demand that the performances need to be by professional actors because that's what the audience will demand and the only way to do that is is again and i, I always sound like i'm harping on about it is for people to value the content and pay for it it isn't it isn't about uh, sort of making millionaires out of anyone because it certainly won't make millionaires out of us. Um, but it is about making it a job that people mm. know that they can make a living at so that we're attracting new talent to audio drama so that people are coming up and wanting to be writers for audio drama, wanting to be producers and directors. And the only way to do that is to make it a career that people can pursue. And that means that the audience that's consuming it has to value the product. Um, and so, you know, one of the reasons why, you know, we made London After Midnight as a package, as the, as the vinyl, as the CDs, as the digital, as the book, is to give people value for money so that they are attracted to, that they get something, oftentimes something they can hold in their hands. Um, because that's often the difference between people thinking of it as disposable content and people thinking of it as content that has value is something they can physically hold. And again, then it comes down to us to make that something that's beautiful to look at and beautiful to listen to. Jack, you were going to jump in. I was just going to, no, I was just going to mention like, you know, there's Apollo plus, which is doing the streaming method for audio fiction. There's audio Teria, which is just launching, you uh, which is doing digital download. That's a, a new, uh, <clears throat> UK based app. So there, there are people now starting to, if you're looking for audio fiction, audio drama, go to the people who supply it. That's it. Yeah, that's it. Jack. Lance and Kenton, I thank all of you for appearing on the Heartland Author Podcast. You were awesome guests. Thank you. No, um, thank, thank you. you. Thank you for having us. Jack, Kenton, and London were amazing guests, and I wish audio fiction, which was common on U.S. radio stations in the early to mid-20th century before the widespread use of television, would make a comeback on American radio. This is Aaron Apollo Camp reminding y'all to write your imagination. Bye for now. You can learn more about me and my book writing projects at camparenapollo.witsite.com forward slash author AAC. You can follow me on Facebook at author AAC and on Instagram at AAC Scribe. Copyright 2023, Aaron Apollo Camp, all rights reserved. This podcast episode is intended for the private listening of our audience. Any reuse or retransmission of this podcast episode without the express written consent of the podcast host is prohibited, except under fair use guidelines. Royalty-free music and sound effects obtained from https colon forward slash forward slash www.zapsplat.com.